Live from Orlando, Florida. Extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube. Covering Pentaho World 2015. Now your hosts, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. Welcome back to Pentaho World, everybody. I'm hanging in there, George. <laughs> I know my voice is gone. I apologize for that, but uh, I'm going to be with you guys for the bulk of the day if I can. James Dixon is here as the CTO of Pentaho, or as his card says, the Lord of Ones and Zeros. Yes. This is binary, James. Welcome to the Cube. Thank you. Thank so, you very much. Tell us about your perspective on Pentaho, Pentaho World, and we want to get into the architecture and your role. Sure. Um, the, um, the event is, is superb. It's, um, it's, it's always fun to see um, our customers, partners, what, what they're doing with the, the platform, the ways that they're extending it and, and expanding it. So that's, that's always a lot of fun um, to see this many people in, in, in one place that you can talk to and, and um, you know, uh, exchange ideas with. Um, the focus for, for me at the moment within Pentaho is on our um, IoT initiative. Um, so not just in um, Pentaho, but all across Hitachi. Um, you know, Hitachi makes a lot of things. It's over 950 companies make up the, the whole um, Hitachi group. Um, they make a lot of sensors, they make a lot of devices, trains, power stations. Um, so they're, Hitachi's very good at, at the things. And you know, obviously with the, the, the connectivity, the, the internet of things becomes um, something that's, that's interesting. Um, particularly from, from an analysis and visualization perspective, um, how do you handle all of that data? What do you, um, what do you need in place to, to orchestrate and manage the, um, the control of all those, um, of all those things? And, and how do you, how do you get the timely events um, processed um, in the right order quickly enough? So for instance, if, if I'm driving my car and um, all of a, I got something in my tire, and so I've got a flat that's about to become a blowout. Um, if I'm notified in time to pull over two lanes and stop, that's a $500 problem I have. If I get a blowout, hit the railing in the median, hit three cars on the way over, and end up upside, upside down in a ditch, that's no longer a $500 problem. Um, and if you look at a lot, lot of the, the catastrophes in the oil industry, a lot of those um, could have been avoided by incredibly rapid automated detection and um, <clears throat> to, to stop a chain of events. And it's complicated because, let's say a, a pump explodes. The pump can't tell me that it's exploded because it's exploded. But the pressure sensors either side, maybe one of them, you know, the pressure drops to zero, the one on the other side, the pressure goes through the roof. Those are the, the devices that can tell me about the problem of the pump in the middle. So it's not just a, a case of looking at the data coming from one device. You have to infer things um, sometimes from other devices that, that give you information about what the actual, uh, what the actual problem so is. So what kind of infrastructure change has to occur for that vision to become a reality? It sounds like Pentaho is ready for it. Is the world? Um, it's the, uh, the, the stack, there's a lot of layers in that IoT stack. There's 10 or 12 different layers um, of things that you need in there. Um, one of the things that, that I'm working on at the moment is, is a thing that I'm calling state analytics. <clears throat> which is the, the analysis of state, you know, exactly how are things right now. In the, uh, if you look at the classic applications, um, HR, ERP, CRM, from a technical perspective, they're called state machines. They basically, they store the current state. The system knows my address, um, so the HR system, it knows my address, it knows my name, my phone number, it knows all of those things, and it, it's actually redundant, because I know those things. So it's storing that information about me um, in a central system so that people can access it easily so they can report on it. But it's essentially, it's, it's redundant because I know that information, but it's good that the system knows it because people don't call me all the time asking for me for those pieces of information. The, the problem with those, those systems is that they only remember the current state of everything. They don't remember the history. So if you can ask a CRM system, how many customers do you have? It can tell you immediately. If you want to know how many customers you had yesterday, it has no idea. You have to go back through these things called change logs, where, okay, we, we added a customer, we lost a customer, we lost another one, we added three customers. You have to go back through this log, um, adding and, and removing you know, to the, the count to find out the number of, of customers. And so <coughs> the, the analytics industry has been focused on time series analysis because time series analysis was really hard. 
because the systems didn't understand their own history. So, so just to bump that up a little bit, because Dave's suggesting I, I like to talk at, I like to draw the most technical uh, conversations out of our guests and in an attempt to make it perhaps more digestible for, for a larger segment, it sounded to me like you're saying the um, um, analytics industry sort of had a backfill for what these old legacy systems of record could do in that they didn't, the, the legacy systems didn't really keep track of history, so we had to build up new systems that did. Yes, yeah, and so we now have those, we now have those systems for doing history. What we, what we haven't realized in the IoT space yet is that the, um, the, your device like an iPhone has, there's a lot of information on here that's only stored on my phone. So how much, what my battery level is, how much uh, space I have left, um, that's only stored on my phone. It's not stored centrally, redundantly, like an old HR system would be. So in other words, now we have a new set of systems, devices, devices that have some amount of history on them, but the systems that are keeping track of them, that are managing them, they don't have that same notion of, of stuff that's happening over time. It's, yeah, so the, the, the stuff that's happening over time is for quite easy, because that's what you put into the data lake. So part of the IoT architecture is a data lake okay. where you take all the, all the information you get from the devices as they're running, you, you pour those into the data lake. So you can do history and trending. Um, <coughs> the, the thing that's <coughs> missing is, let's say um, you've got smart cars. They continue to send you their location um, until someone turns off the engine and gets out. Let's say you have a question of how many, how many vehicles do I have with enough gasoline to get to Baltimore in the next two hours? Well, if the car has been sitting in the parking lot for three days without being on, we don't know where it is anymore. The car knows where it is, and it will tell you that as soon as someone you know, turns the ignition back on, but the, the central system has no idea where that car is. It ha we would have to go back into the data lake and look at the history of that vehicle to work out where it is right now. So a, a practical application would be, um, let's say I've got a, um, a predictive model of when a pump will fail. And let's say the, the two main indicators of pump failure are, are pressure and temperature. We can deal with high pressures, we can deal with high temperatures, we can't deal with high pressure and high temperature. Uh -huh. And when these devices are running, they only send the information that's changing. So let's say the, the temperature is fairly constant, but the pressure changes frequently. So we'll get pressure changes every couple of seconds, we'll get the current pressure, but the temperature might be constant for days. Um, and let's say, so the, the, let's say the pressure ticks up a little bit, we now need to, the mathematical model needs to know the current temperature. We might have to go back through a billion records to find out when that pump last told us what the temperature is. And if we're getting a thousand events a second, we can't, a thousand times a second, we can't go back through a billion records trying to piece the, the parts together. So tie this back to how we use um, Pentaho and sort of traditional systems of record today. Um, as, as Dave was asking, it sounds like something that's very different because to understand you know, pressure and temperature, but the temperature we, don't, we haven't seen any results from for 10 billion intervals. Yep. So how does, how does Pentaho have to change to accommodate this type of application? So the, um, I see the, 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 the system that's necessary for IoT um, being, there's an architecture called the Lambda architecture, which is basically a data lake and a real-time system. Okay. And so we're now adding real-time. You real might have time. to bump that one up a, yeah, a well, little we, bit. We, yeah, okay. so, the, so you've got these three main systems. You've got the data lake for the history, you've got a real-time system for handling the streaming events, and then you've got this, this state repository for knowing exactly how, it, how is each device right now. So the challenge for Pentaho is that we have to work with all three of those data sources, be able to query them, be able to join the, the results together um, as questions are being asked. We've also got to handle blending. So if I've got a subscription service, I don't really care how many devices I'm selling because I sell a subscription. I'm giving the devices away. I'm actually losing money when I, when I gain a customer because I'm, I'm giving the device away because it's a subscription. So what I care is are people using my service. So now I want to look at how many devices did I sell, that's in my sales system, and how much is my service being used, that's in my data lake and my real-time system. So I need to blend those two data sets together in a, um, in a reliable, accurate, 
accurate and, uh, and a, in a governed way. So blending becomes very important um, <coughs> of you know, blending these different data sources together, um, making sure that that's accurate, security, uh, metadata, all these things um, play heavily into the, uh, into the complexity of the system. So Pentaho basically is the orchestration and the joining of all these different data sources so and James, data sets. So James, you think about this stuff all the time. I can tell you live it. You think about it at night, you think about it at day, while you're eating breakfast, I'm sure. What is your role specifically, and what's with the title? The, um, so we start with the title first. I was originally, the, the title I gave myself as CTO was Chief Geek, um, and I'd had that title for <clears throat> six or seven years without a promotion. And so I just decided to give myself a promotion. From Chief Alpha Chief, Geek? From Chief Geek to <laughs> Lord of the Ones and Zeros. Um, I'm not sure what I'm, I'm going with next. Um, I actually have my email. It's the stupidest feature in Outlook. You can, have, you can create multiple email signatures in Outlook and tell it to randomly put one of those in, as your email signature. Um, so I have, um, on my email signature, I've got Chief Geek, I've got Lord of the Ones and Zeros, I've got Duke of Earl URL, um, Baron Von Tech. Oh, Duke of Earl <laughs> URL, that's great. <laughs> um, uh, Baron Von Tech. Um, I've got a Big Data Ninja, so I've got a collection of, uh, so no one really knows, if you get an email from me, you don't really know what my title is, it changes <laughs> the next time I, uh, I reply to you. Um, so that's the, you know, the, the story behind the, behind the name. Um, so really what, you know, what I do is, um, you know, when we started looking at Big Data, that's when I came up with the, the whole idea of the data lake. You know, the, the data lake concept uh, was something I came up with um, six or seven years ago when I started looking at the, um, the big data technologies. And I was with our uh, CEO, now Chief Strategy Officer, Richard Daly, we drove up and down Silicon Valley, up and down 101, talking to the Hadoop early adopters, what they were doing with it, what were they trying to achieve, you know, what was the business purpose, what were the technical hurdles. Um, and then I tried to, to take all of those use cases and distill a common, um, you know, what, what are the common elements? Uh, most of them were, were structured data, um, but then I, I, I came up, tried to come up with an analogy to help explain to people, you know, there's a set of use cases that can be looked at one way. Um, and I tried a number of different analogies before settling on the, the data lake. Um, it's not an ocean, because the, the lake gives you a, a, an idea that it's confined in some way, it's constrained, it's bounded. Um, but you know, lake water is not clean water. So this is, this is raw, um, it's not um, processed, it's not filtered, it's not distilled. So I, I compare the data lake to say a data warehouse, which is highly structured, you've got aisles and, and pallets. So it's like getting bottled water out of a, um, out of a warehouse. Um, it's highly organized. The water is cleansed and purified great, and bottled. Great, yeah. So it's it's made, it's managed in a way that it's easily accessible and easily to navigate. Yeah. And so, but the data lake is is complete opposite. It's raw. It's unstructured. It's okay. just an enormous amount of of raw data. So, how does your vision of IoT affect architecture, product? How does it get translated into something that I can buy? So we have to. So first, we got to look at the. Um, th there's the technical aspects of what the platform needs to do. There's the business purpose. So what's the business purpose of this platform? Is it something that we sell? Is it an enabling technology for all of uh, Hitachi's uh, many businesses? Is this an open source thing that we're making available to everyone? So we need to decide what the uh, what is the business purpose of this platform, and then we get to the the technical nature of what are all the different pieces in there. Um, and it gets coming. If you consider something like. Do, should this be cloud-based or should this be on-premise? There are some people that will want this on-premise, there are some people that want it on the cloud. So now we've got something that needs to be to run in two environments. And you know, when it comes to the database, some people will want to use um, Hadoop, some people will want to use you know, Vertical or Greenplum. So the, the platform needs to be very flexible. Um, so really what my job is with, with um, several other groups in Hitachi is, is to define what this architecture looks like and then we'll go off and, and, and build it. So, you know, when, when you talked about driving up and down 101 and looking at the early use cases of Hadoop, I think many of them were, I mean, the earliest, of course, was the web crawl. But, like, Yahoo talked very specifically about making it easy to sort of change a data warehouse, you know, pipeline. Um, if we were to say, 
because there's you know now we've got buzz around Internet of Things, but we always have clear use cases in mind. Yep. Have you seen a couple early use cases that have things in common, the same way the ETL offload did, or the um, yes. da data warehouse offload? Yeah, absolutely. So you've got the. Um, so some of it, you, know, you look at smart buildings and, and smart cars. Um, so there are the, the exercises around um, optimization of resources. So reducing electricity, uh, reducing fuel costs, uh, working with one of our customers, and their goal is basically to save uh, $5 million a year in, in gasoline costs for pumps. They're not, they don't know, uh, sometimes they, they leave pumps running longer than they need to, and they estimate they can save $5 million a year just by shutting pumps down sooner. But okay. they need mathematical models to work out exactly when to shut those pumps down. Um, so you've got the, you've got the optimization, um, that's one use case. Um, capacity planning is another one. So you're looking at, um, I've got all these devices, as people buy more and more devices, I need more and more infrastructure to handle um, serving up the, uh, the data that those applications need. Um, so there's the capacity planning aspect. Um, and then there's the failure prediction. The failure what? Failure prediction. Oh yeah. Um, so, and failure prediction or something like a fraud detection where you're basically running a, um, as, as each event comes in, you run a, a mathematical model to determine whether there's a problem or not. So, for those, would those three examples have um, sort of common elements among them or would, would each have its own sort of uh, optimal way of you know, configuring um, Pentaho and some additional technologies, if any. Yeah, so there, um, there's a large amount of overlap in uh, technology-wise in all three use cases. So for instance, in the failure prediction, you need a mathematical model. Um, you cannot build a mathematical model without looking at all of the history in the data lake. So you need the data lake there for the modeling purpose, but at runtime, the, the mathematical model is, is running as the events come in and you don't need the date lake uh, anymore. Okay. Um, so oh, there's some, some, some there's different is, phases. So this is the classic, I build my prediction batch mode, put it into production on near real time or real time data. Yes, That's exactly. simple? Yes. Yep. Would that same model work for uh, capacity planning? Um, so capacity planning is looking yeah, purely just at the, at the data lake, basically looking at history and time series. Ah, okay. uh, with the capacity planning, um, you very seldom need um, access to the real-time data because you're, okay. you're looking at trends over, um, over weeks or months and, and you don't need the real-time okay. aspects as much on that's, the capacity planning. That's really clear. So then what about the, I would, I would guess then smart buildings and cars where you're optimizing resources that sounds like another one where you need both. Yes, that is, um, so you need to look at the history. So you might have example where, okay, for the next few hours, I only have one meeting room booked on this floor. If we move that meeting to another floor, now I can shut down that entire floor. Every light bulb, the AC, I can shut off that floor okay. just by moving a meeting. So it's that kind of um, optimization, looking at all the different resources, saving electricity, saving power. Um, yes, there, there's definitely an element to, to analyzing the, the history. But then also, it's, it again comes down to the, the real time of, of you know, what, what, which devices are on and which ones can I turn off. All right, James, we have to leave it there. Thanks very much for coming on theCUBE and sharing your vision of IoT. It was great to have you on. Yeah, thank you very much. It was fun. All right, keep right there, buddy. We'll be back with our next guest right after this. This is theCUBE. We're live from Pentaho World 2015. Right back. <laughs>